So we're glad to have Michal Quick from Brown, uh, although currently from the Midtag Upflare Institute in Sweden, where Abba has just released a new album. So he's presumably involved with that. Uh, and uh, he's going to tell us about logarithmic resolution of singularities by multi weighted blocks. Okay, yeah, thank you. Thanks, Vakil, for, for the introduction. And thank you for inviting me to speak today. Uh, so this is joint work in progress with Dan. Uh, and there are some results in an earlier work by, by me. Uh, so, I, so, so I'll kind of reference it by this, uh, QUE20. So let's start. Uh, so the main theorem, which is this theorem, is log embedded resolution characteristic zero. So actually from this theorem, we, we, can, uh, like we can deduce log resolution in general. But, but, but for this talk, let's just stick to log embedded resolution. So, so the so the theorem starts with x being a closed reduced subset of a smooth. Uh, so let me use another color. Uh, of a smooth, strict toroidal thin stack. So here I want I I I just want to say this are uh, this just means that uh, this thin stack is smooth. Uh, plus log smooth over k. And in, in even like, like in even simpler terms, this is just you can just think of this as move over k uh, plus a normal crossings divisor. But but in the strict toroidal case, you are looking at a simple normal crossing divisor on the step. So I just want to say we, we, we are doing everything on our thin stack because because when, when, when we do multi-weighted blowups, we kind of have to leave the world of schemes and enter the world of Artin stack. So that's the reason why this theorem is written in terms of Artin stacks. So let X be a close reduced substack of a, of a smooth plus not smooth Artin stack Y over a few K of characteristic zero. Then there exists a sequence of multi-weighted blowups. So this is something I'll define at the start of the talk later. So there exists a sequence of multi-weighted blowups, you know, that, like yeah. this pi. Uh, with successive proper transforms, x, y, contained in y, i. So proper transform is something I will define later on as well. Uh, oh. Such that x, n, this, this proper transform at the n is a smooth toroidal artin stack over k. So, so all its singularities are, are resolved. And one feature of, the, of multi-weighted blowouts are each of these y, i uh, are, are also not smooth. So here I just want to say two things. This is a feature uh, of multi-weighted blocks. So, so multi-weighted blocks ensure that your ambient space is always small, plus log small. Uh, and another thing I want to say is uh, this, this log structure on YI. So the log structure on YI uh, is induced by that of uh, yi minus one and the exceptional device. So this is something I'll make precise later on. And then the second thing is pi is an isomorphism over the smooth locus of x. So this is a very standard feature of Fibonacci's resolution. And the last feature is uh, if you look over the singular locus, uh, you, you get precisely a simple normal crossing device on, on XN. And this procedure is functorial with respect to log smooth morphisms of pairs. So but by this, I just mean if, if I have uh, a Cartesian square like this, so, so, so this, this, this morphism F is log smooth. Uh, then, then the resolution of, uh, so so the resolution of x tilde contained in y tilde is precisely that that of. So let me just write. So so if I denote this by uh, x infinity contained in y infinity, then this this functorality just says that uh, when I look at this pullback, back, uh, this this top row. Oh, this this top row here is is precisely the resolution of x tilde contained in y tilde. So that's functor reality. So before I move on, uh, uh, are there any questions? 
Okay, great. So, so, so we prove this theorem in steps. So, so that's the next main theorem. So the so main theorem B says that let X contain in Y as before, but X is singular. Then there exists a multi-weighted blow up Y prime mapping to Y with proper transform uh, X prime contain in Y prime such that Y prime is a smooth toroidal open stack Y K. Uh, so once again, this is a feature of multi-weighted blow ups. Uh, and then part two says that, so part two, this is something I'll introduce later on in the talk. So there's all this invariant going around. Uh, so these are precisely what? Uh, these are precisely the singularity invariants in our paper. So it's a singularity invariant. It's a measure of singularities. So part two precisely says that uh, there's an immediate improvement in singularity after each multi-weighted model. So this is something that is not present in Fibonacci's resolution. Uh, so, 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 so this invariant is something I'll tell you later on. Uh, and then part three says that pi is an isomorphism away from the close-up stack consisting of points, such that uh, invariant at p is precisely the maximum invariant. So what this just says is uh, I'm always uh, modifying the worst singular openings. So, so I'm only modifying the worst singular locus and nothing else. Uh, and then the last thing is standard. It's functorial with respect to log smooth, but this time you need subjective uh, morphisms of pairs because it's possible that sometimes you pull back and get empty blow ups. So this is something I'll say later on again. Uh, yeah, so that's the main theorem. So, 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 so theorem A, it's just deduced from theorem B, just by reiterating this process. Uh, so one remark here I want to say is, if X is contained in Y uh, of pure co-dimension C, then you just reiterate uh, theorem B uh, to the maximum invariant uh, drops to a sequence of ones. Uh, so this is. And then this sequence is of length C. So that's how you deduce theorem A. So that, that proves theorem A. Uh, it, so, so it proves theorem A in the pure co-dimension case. And, and in general, you just have to do something extra. Uh, yeah, and that's it. So that's, that's the main theorems. So any questions? Actually, I, I, a comment, it turns out, as I just found out, that Brian Conrad is teaching algebraic geometry and ends at 12. And of course he uh, is keeping his students late to grill them more. So some are just coming in. So they may, so you may want to, I, I may just for, so they, cause they'll be interested uh, in case someone comes in just to fill them in on where we are. But I think they'll be able to understand. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So, so, so maybe later on I can come back to this like after everything is done. So, so the main thing I just want to say here is uh, even if you don't understand anything else, uh, there's one thing which I want to say today, which is multi-weighted blow ups. So this is this is something inspired by uh, toric geometry. So 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 in, so define multi-weighted blow ups via an example. So so this example is such that one multi-weighted blow up uh, resolves all singularities, as, as you can see here. So the example is take i to be this ideal. Uh, contain in kx, y, z, and then set x to be the vanishing locus of this, this ideal contained in y. And then one thing I want to say here is the, the log structure on y is precisely setting, uh, is, is precisely given by the SNC devices, uh, y, z plus z. So, so whenever you have a variable that is part of the log structure, we will we'll always underline those variables. Uh, so maybe, and then we will see. So maybe just to make sure everyone's on the same page, SNC is simple normal crossings, and yeah. and, if, and if they don't know what log structures are, they can still follow everything you're saying, and they just shouldn't worry. So yeah. So if you don't understand log structures uh, or, or log geometry in general, you can just, uh, as as I said earlier, you can just interpret smooth toroidal as just uh, smooth toroid K plus a uh, SNC device. So so here I would say this is a smooth. Uh, strict toroidal uh, scheme. 
and it's strict toroidal because uh, you have strict normal process or simple normal process. So, so this is the example of today. Uh, and then we will see later that the, the algorithm in theorem B instructs us precisely to take the multi-weighted dot along this monomial ID. Uh, but one thing I want to say here is, okay, that's, that's for later. So, so the first step to, to, to define multi-weighted blocks is to sketch the Newton polytope P of J. So here, here as, as you can see on the diagram on the left, uh, this, this dot here is just X squared. This dot here is Y squared Z, and this is Z cubed. And then how you define a Newton polytope is you, 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 you take the upper convex hull of these three points. So, so this Newton polytope is everything that is uh leave, it, it's everything that's leaving above like all this hyperplane. Uh, right. So it's everything leaving above this. So that's your Newton polytope. And then one thing I want to say here is uh it's a coincidence that this Newton polytope of J uh is the Newton polytope of I, but 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 this is not true in general. Uh, so it's only true for this. It's it's only true for this example. So we want to take the multi-weighted block along this monomial ideal and, and, and we sketch the Newton polytope. And the next thing is to from, from this Newton polytope, we can get a normal fan. So so by normal fan, I mean that um like along each of these facets, there's a normal ray. Uh, that's perpendicular to this facet, right? So, so for example, this this facet has has a normal ray pointing outwards. S same for this facet, and same for this facet, and same for this facet, right? So, so for example, the the normal ray coming up from this plane here uh, is precisely uh, one zero zero, right? And then this would be uh, zero one zero. And this would be zero zero one. And then this 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 two dots you can work it out. So so I'll write down it later. And then the the way you define the normal fan is if you just connect these dots whenever there's a intersection. So for example, let me just draw the general picture. So so are are you just to make sure I understand? You just take the Newton polytope and you blow up the ideal. Kind of generated by the jet by like the, the yeah yeah by these monomials. Okay, great. Uh, so so give me a moment. Let me draw this properly so that I don't. So just now I said there's there's a ray coming out of each of these facets, right? Uh, and then you have a ray here as well. You have a ray here as well. And then the point is you 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 connect each of these dots whenever there's like a intersection here, right? So here there's. There's another line connecting it. Uh, and then this would be your cross section uh, of the normal term. So by cross section, I mean that uh, you can kind of think of this as like coming out from the origin, right? Uh, I don't know if this is a good picture. It's like, it's something like this, right? So it's like cross section uh, of, of this normal fan. And that's precisely the next slide. So, so that's how I obtain this picture, right? This, this, these two pictures look, look the same, right? And then this, this is the normal ray to, so, so, so this E1 is the normal ray to this facet and so on and so forth, right? And then you can work out that U1 and U2 are precisely given by this vector. So this is a cross section of the normal fan. And then through through this normal fan, you get you 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 get precisely a homomorphism z five mapping to z three, uh, which maps e one to e one, uh, maps e two to e two, it maps e three to e three, and then you you just map e e four to u one, uh, and e five to u two. And then for now, I just want to say just just ignore this this letters here. So so I'll come back to those letters later, but but for now you can just ignore them. So so That's so far so far you you blew things up and you dealt with the singularity and right now you're mentioning this fan and this fan is not connected to the geometry yet but it will be soon is that right? 
uh, this fan is not connected to the geometry. What do you mean just, by that? I guess. Well, I mean, you just, you define the fan, but you didn't say anything about, I mean, you, you've, uh, you said the first bull up, uh, this monomial ideal, and you said, oh, by the way, here's this, uh, here's this normal fan. So is it, what is the normal Yeah, fan? yeah, yeah. What so is everything that? is not motivated right now, but, but I'll motivate it later on. Perfect. So, Great. So, so, so now you have this homomorphism, beta, uh, it, it maps in this way. And then beta fits exactly into this exact sequence. So right now, so just now I, I, I told you E1 maps to E1, right? E2 maps to E2 and E3 maps to E3. And then here you have U1 and U2. And then normally I'll write this by, by, by line separating these two entries. So normally I call this that the exceptional rays because they correspond to like facets which are not your standard facet, right? And then how you get the kernel is just precisely, uh, it's it, so it's so it's very it, it's very convenient in this case. You just put this matrix here upstairs, and then you just fill it by the negative of the identity matrix. So that's that's our exact sequence. And then right now you leave the normal fan sigma on Z three to a smooth fan uh, sigma bar on Z five, generated by this this bones here. Whereas sigma hat is just the cone spanned by those EI, such that beta of EI maps precisely into that cone. And then now here comes the definition. The multimeter block is just given by this. But one thing I want to say here is this is largely related to the Cox construction in toric geometry, if you've heard that before. So, what the Cox construction is, uh, so in general, uh, let's see. So, so in general, if you have a toric variety x sigma, so remember sigma is a normal thing, right? But what the Cox construction does is it kind of presents this x sigma. Uh, so you can find a like almost geometric portion of it. Oh, so so this is um okay. So I think I misunderstood. So in general, what you're going to do is not blow up some toric ideal in general, or maybe or you know maybe you are, but really what I should think is if I have the is it like you have a cone over toric variety uh, under some objective embedding, what you'll do is you'll resolve this will resolve that cone, and anything looking like that cone will get resolved in such a way. Or what exactly is this? What is this cone? Or maybe I'll explain later. What is this? What is this construction doing? Ah. Uh... That's a very hard question. Let me think about it. Uh, so, so what this construction is doing is, uh, so, so in my first paper, you kind of do resolution via weighted toroidal blocks, where you get something log smooth. So this is something log smooth because it's a toric variety. And then what, what Dan and me had in mind was, uh, if, if you want to make the ambient space log smooth, uh, like, like right now, the ambient space is not smooth, but if you want to make it smooth, like, like the way to do it is pass it through the Cox construction. And then you get a smooth art stack upstairs. So, okay, so that, okay, maybe I should, so you, so version one before this talk, or like what you did before would be, blow, would be a toric blow up, like blowing up some anomial ideal. And then now you're doing something more complicated or clever. Yeah. Uh, and that's, uh, and that, that's gonna do, that's better than that in some way that the total space that, that now I'm not even sure that, uh, that's going to be better. Yeah, so, so maybe I didn't, so maybe I didn't do a great job here. Uh, so, so in my first paper, what, what I did was, so you have this center, right? And then what my first paper did was, uh, you, you kind of take the Reese algebra of this center and you take the stacky torch. And, and that stacky torch will be lots more. But, but, but not smooth, right? But, but if you want to make it smooth, uh, that's, that's, that's what the Cox construction is doing. Uh, you're trying to make it smooth by, uh, by, by, by lifting this normal fan upstairs to, to Z5, right? So, so upstairs, you get this smooth fan. And that's how you end up with a smooth correct variety. Is that okay? So, so, so one thing, so, so let me just quickly go through the definition. So, so the multi-weighted block is defined by, by this Artin stack. Uh, 
where x sigma hat, uh, this is the smooth choric variety associated with this smooth band. Uh, G beta is just the kernel of, so if I put torus, if, if I take the tori everywhere, uh, G, G beta is just the kernel of this homomorphism of tori. And that's how I get GM square. So, so that's how I get an Artin stack in general. And then pi J is just induced by the toric morphism X sigma hat mapping to A3 defined by beta. So writing down beta required you to choose an ordering of the rays. Does that not matter? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. That, that, that does not matter. So, so I can, yeah, I can switch this around. Like, like it does not matter anymore. So, so right now the definition is kind of convoluted. Uh, but, but, but the next slide I'll write every time, like write everything down in coordinates, and then you can see it very explicitly. So, so are there any questions before we move on? So you, it, so so one thing I want to say is if you haven't seen this Cox construction before, this this can seem kind of magical. Uh, so 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 one thing I want to say here is, it is kind of magical. You, yeah, you, 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 like 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 you should not think that this is easy or yeah. So if I write everything down in coordinates, this is a, actually an exercise uh, in correct geometry. I mean. You can look up what's construction. So, so if I if I write down the coordinates for this, right, uh, I get precisely this map here. So, so here I have the variables x, y, and z. And then for, for each of these x, y, and z, there's an x prime, y prime, and z prime. And then you have your exceptional devices here. So this like exceptional device. And then this is the irrelevant ideal in, in the cross construction. Uh, so one thing I want to say is, how, like, how do you determine this irrelevant ideal? So here I wrote that the, the irrelevant ideal can be determined from the maximum cones of sigma. So, so the way you do it is, if I go back two slides ago, right, that's, how I, that's, that's the meaning of these letters. So, so each time you get a maximal cone, you just look at which rays are not in that maximal cone. So, so in this case, you have E2 and E3, uh, which are not in this maximal cone, right? And then E2 corresponds to Y, and E3 corresponds to Z, or rather Y prime and Z prime. And that's how I obtain Y prime, Z prime here. And then same for this maximal cone. Uh, you have the rays U2 and E3 not, not being in it. And then that's how I get Z prime and U2. And then same for this x prime. For, for this x prime, you have E1 that's not, not, not in this maximal cone. So that's how you determine the, 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 the irrelevant ideal. Uh, once again, this is an exercise. My, once again, this is an exercise on like kind of sh shoving under the rough. So uh, this is something, yeah, in public geometry. And then another thing is from this matrix beta from earlier, right? I had this matrix beta. Uh, you can see that pi j is induced by precisely this, this, this assignment. So the way I see it is, if you write x, y, z here, uh, x prime, y prime, z prime, and u1, u2, then you precisely see that x maps to x prime times u1 cube times u2, and that's how I got this. And then same for, for y, y maps to u prime, times, uh, so there's a mistake here actually, this is supposed to be zero. So it's y prime times uh, u1 square, and that's how I got this. And then same for z, z max to z prime times u1 square times u2 square. And that's how I get the morphism. And then, so, so another thing I want to explain is this, this gm2 action right here. So the gm2 action is precisely saying that um, there, there are like Z2 weights on this, this variables here. And then how I get the Z2 weights is, remember from earlier, there's this morphism alpha, right? Defining the kernel. And this alpha precisely gives you the Z2 weights. So if I just write X prime, U prime, U prime, U1, U2, then, then the rows precisely give me the Z2 weight. So X prime is precisely given the weight three one. 
and so on and so forth. And then U1 and U2, as I mentioned, they are the exceptional devices. And then finally, I want to say that upstairs, I've also indicated the log structure, right? By, by underlining this, this like, like these variables, right? And then this log structure is actually, it's, it's, the, it's given by that on A3, right? So A3, I underline Y and Z. So upstairs, I underline Y prime and Z prime. And then you have the exceptional devices as well. And then under this log, log structure, it, this, this R2 stack is smooth plus log smooth. I mean, it's, it's, evident, it's, it's evidently smooth. And then it's log smooth because your, like, like, like these devices are precisely S and C. So any questions before I say something? Uh, no, okay. So, so one thing I wanna say here is, this, this log structure I'm indicating here, uh, it, so, so one warning I wanna say is this log structure here is not the log structure given on this, this toric variety. Because, because the log structure given on this toric variety would be the one given by underlying X prime as well. Right. So one warning I wanna say is this pi j is in general not log smooth. Uh, Right, like, like earlier I said that uh, pi j right, was induced by toric morphism. So, so you would think that it's log smooth, uh, but, it's not, it's, but it's not log smooth under this log structure, uh, precisely because you have something weird coming from here. So somehow it's not log smooth, but we shouldn't worry about it because still the log structure comes from these coordinates in some Way that yeah, why don't we understand? So it comes from its pre pre predecessor, okay. like, like in a sense. Uh, yeah, okay. So so that's the example for multi-weighted blocks. And then right now I want to show that uh this this multi-weighted block precisely resolves all singularities. So just now I I I I I had this idea, right? So, so if I take the total transform, that's precisely mapping x to this, right? y to that, and z to that, and so on and so forth. And then if you calculate everything, and you pull out the exceptional device, uh, then, then you get what, what we call the weak transform. Uh, but, but in this case, this is also the proper transform, uh, because the ideal is principal. Uh, so that's, that's something I'll, so so the proper transform is something I'll define later on. And then from, from this weak transform, I claim that the vanishing locus of this weak transform, it's it's smooth and not smooth. And that's where the magic comes in. So that's the next slide. So indeed, if you compute the log derivatives of, of this, right? So so by log derivative, I mean if you take uh so x prime is not part of the log structure. So you get the usual derivative, uh, but then y prime is part of the log structure. So you have to include this 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 log log differential operator, and then so and so forth. Uh, so you have u one, u two, right? So if you calculate everything, uh, so so let's say if I apply this operator, right? Uh, I'll get x prime. Right. Uh, if I apply this operator, uh, I, I, I will get precisely this, right? That's because, so, so let me just write it up. Right. Right. This is just y prime, uh, which is the y prime. Right. So you get precisely the, the same monomial there. And then this thing is just, uh, so so look so observe here that I I'm calculating uh like less than or equals to one right so so if I have this two I can kind of subtract it from this and then that's how I obtain the last monomial here right so that's precisely the this is the ideal uh cutting of uh not singularity. Right. 
So, so now, now my claim is this is precisely one. Uh, that's because if you observe, right, just now I had this, this irrelevant ID here, right? So that's, so, so from the irrelevant ID, I, I, I get precisely this X prime chart, this Y prime Z prime chart, and this Y prime U2 chart. And then on each chart, uh, these things are all units, right? So on the X prime chart, this will be a unit. On this chart, this will be a unit. And this, on, like, on this chart, this will be a unit. So that's how I get this to be one. And then since this is one, uh, that's why this is not smooth. Right. And then it's it once your locks move, you are immediately smooth, right? Because I mean this this is contained in that. So so if this is one, this 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 must be the one. This 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 must be the unit ID as well. So this is one example whereby. I just want to show how this motivated block uh, immediately resolves our similarity. So you didn't just say that log smooth implies smooth in that way, did you? Again? You didn't just say log smooth implies smooth. So, so, in, this, so, so in this case, it does, because right. you have something embedded uh, in a smooth plus log smooth. I got it, OK. Right, but, 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 but not true in general. Uh, yeah, so, so that's. So, so this is a manifestation of theorem B. And then through the process, I've, I've defined multi-weighted blocks, uh, even though in kind of a convoluting way, but there's, there's like no way I can avoid this actually. I mean, this this just how the process works. I mean, that's, 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 the, that's the reason for multi-weighted. So you have multiple weights, right? Here I have a GM2 action, right? Compared to a, a, a stacky clock I will be modding out by GM. Right, that's a single weight, but here you have multi weights. Okay, so before I move on to the next section, are there any questions? I guess not. Okay, so I've defined multi weighted blocks, uh, and then just now from the intro, right? So let me go all the way back to the intro. Right, there's also this invariant which I have to define. Right. So that's the next goal. So the next goal would be more, more like more down to earth. Well, actually, there are a few comments here. So one thing is multi-weighted blocks are examples of fantastics, if you heard of them before. And then this this multi-weighted blocks are like like a good kind of our thin stacks as well, because they, they emit good good moduli space. So the good moduli space is precisely this correct way. Uh, X of this normal fan. Uh, and then generally, multi weighted blocks can be done along a monomial ideal, or more generally, a monomial Riesz algebra. So, whenever you have a monomial Riesz algebra, you just uh, pass to a sub algebra, uh, a, a, a Veronese sub algebra, which is generated in degree one. Well, so, uh, what is it, what's the meaning of the phrase can be done along? What does the word along mean there? So, so just now I said, so just now I had this notation, right? So along this means what 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 is this center here? Ah, oh, I got it. Okay, great. So 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 the center of the blow up is is a monomial ideal, or or more generally, you can do a monomial Riesz algebra. Even though this this requires more, more more work. I mean, yeah, but 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 I shall skip it. Yeah, I mean, like it's kind of complicated as well. Um, and then. Part four is uh, earlier we have only indicated how to define the weak transform, right? I factor out as many exceptional devices as possible, right? And then analogous to the classical case whereby you you just you you just take normal blow ups, the proper transform is just obtained by factoring out as many exceptional devices, not not from i, but from each individual element of the total transform. So this is just uh, the the weak transform. That you just factor out. Uh, from, from I itself instead from, from, from each element. So, so that's the difference. So this is just, just a subtle remark. Uh, 
Okay, so, so now let's move on to the next goal. So the next goal is to define the singularity invariant uh, in, in theorem B. So more generally, we have defined this in of PI uh, for any ideal I and any point in the vanishing locus of I. So one, one remark I want to say here is just now I had this smooth corridor Artin stack in, in like in the theorem, right? Uh, but but since the algorithm is like smooth local, we can always pass to a smooth straight corridor case game. So smooth log smooth locally, every such Artin stack uh, uh, looks like a smooth straight corridor case game. So therefore, from now on, we will always assume uh, why is a smooth straight corridor case game. So by this, I just meant smooth over k uh, plus uh, SMC device. So the SNC device so can just call it B. And then now, now I define, now, now I just set some things up. So at every close point P in Y, we may always choose a regular system of parameters. Whereby X1 to Xn minus R, these are what we call ordinary parameters, means they are not part of the log structure. Uh, but then you also have this monomial parameters. So these are precisely part of the log structure. And then by that, I just mean, these variables here, they precisely cut out B at P. So whenever, uh, so whenever I have monomial parameters, I will, I, I will always underline them. So that's why I underline them. Uh, and then through this, we have this sheaf of log differential operators in Y. So these are locally generated over OY by your standard derivatives, right? Because X1 and Xn minus R are not part of the log structure. And then you have this extra differential operator. So, so, so the reason for, for this log name is precisely, this, these are precisely the differential operators which preserve the ID of B. So preserve the, so by this I just mean, for example, this, right? It, 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 it preserves XN. Uh, and then later on, I'll kind of explain what's the point of loop. What's the point of using log differential operator? Uh, but right now, we just take this as, as it is. And then we, we denote by this symbol uh, precisely the log differential operators of order less than or equals to n. And then now, now, now there are three ingredients which I want to define uh, before I define in. So the, first so, so the first ingredient is just log order. Uh, so the log order is just defined by as the minimum n such that whenever you differentiate to the nth stage, uh, you, you, you get precisely the unit ideal. So, so the usual order uh, always lies in n, right? But the log order, it's possible that you end up with infinity. So, so you get infinity precisely when this, this, like, like this set is empty. So for example, uh, let me just say an example. So, so, so an example whereby you get something that's infinity is, for example, things that, that, that look like this, for example. Yeah. And then if you, like no matter how much you differentiate this, I mean, no, no matter how much you log differentiate this, right, you're just gonna get back i, right? So, so the log infinite, I guess it's just infinite. So that's the log order. And then here comes the point of why we use the log differential operators. So note that this is a stronger invariant than the usual order. So consider this, this curve that we all know and love, right? So, uh, right, so you, you get this smooth, smooth curve, right? Right, this, this, this is y equals x squared. Uh, but here I've indicated y to be part of the log structure, right? So you have this SNC device over here. Okay. Right, this is y plus v. This is part of the log structure. So here I say that x is evidently smooth, right? The, like the order is one everywhere. But if you consider log order, the log order is two, which, which means precisely that x is not log smooth over here. So the problem is because that it, like, like if you look at this curve here, right? It's not transverse to this. Uh, log stratum y equals z. So in some sense, log order you're trying to capture 
you're, you're trying to single out parameters which are transverse to the log squared term. That's the, so, so that's the point of using log, log differential operation. And then you have this second ingredient as well. So maximum contact elements. So suppose that the log order uh, is strictly less than infinity uh, and it's greater than or equals to one. Then a log maximal contact element of i at t. Uh, it's just an element at this a minus one stage, uh, which has precisely log order one. So this just means uh, this maximal contact is like an empty cumulative. Uh, you're just finding an, you're just finding an, an like like an anti derivative of one. Uh, or, or in other words, it can be extended to a system of ordinary parameters of t. And then one thing here I want to note is since characteristic k is equal to zero, uh, you, you always have this. So you can separate out dA by d1 followed by dA minus one. So locally, we can always choose an anti derivative of one. And that's why maximum contact elements always end this locally. So this is a key. This, this, this is basically the key place where, where we use characteristic k equals to zero. So for example, in the earlier example, right? In, in here. Uh, so in this example, right, the maximum contact element uh, of i at zero is, for example, x, right? This is this is one maximum contact element, but, but you can have higher order terms as well. Right, so somehow this maximum contact elements, you're trying to choose something that is like touching the vanishing locus of I maximally, but still being transverse to the, the log strap term. So that's the definition of maximum contact element. Uh, and then the third ingredient is monomial saturation, which is just passing to the infinity of I. Uh, so this is a monomial ideal with respect to log square, with, with respect to log squared term y, in the sense that this is locally generated by monomials uh, in this monomial parameters. Right. So, and then another thing I want to say is, is that it's also the smallest monomial ideal containing i. So some examples are, so for example, if I look at this example from earlier, right. Uh, then, then this monomial saturation is precisely zero. Uh, that's because I, I have this x square hanging out, right? And then the, if I look at the second example, uh, this, here I'm underlying x and y. And then if I pass the monomial saturation, it's precisely x square, y square. So you're just taking out this term. And then this, this should be compared to the third example where I underline z now. So if I underline Z, then I have to carry Z along the way as well. So that's the definition of monomial saturation. So you can verify this very easily. So, oh, so, that, so, so now I think I'm getting lost by the example. Is the, um, the monomial, so maybe the two, the second or third example might be the best, might be most enlightening. It's the smallest. So you have to, they're generated by monomials that are among the log structure monomials, the underlying variables. Yeah, that's right. Is that right? And it's a small okay. Yeah, yeah. You, so, so, so it's like finding monomial generators for the ID, in right. a sense. So here you are finding precisely this monomial generator. So the first case that ideal does not contain I. Okay. Yeah, that's one thing which. Uh, yeah. So okay. So so by smallest I mean. Uh, you 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 can't take the interception of. All the monomial ideals uh, containing i. Oh, so uh, maybe none. Okay. But but if this it, like like this set is empty, we just define it as zero. That's basically. Okay. Yeah, that's so so this is kind of wrong actually. I, I'm yeah. so sorry about that. Mm. Yeah, that's the reason why Dan wrote it this way. I guess. Uh, yeah. So that's that's the monomial saturation. Uh, so using this three ingredient, this this three ingredients. I can now define the singularity invariant. 
So, so to do this first, I actually need to associate some auxiliary data uh, to, to, to this pair, i plus some point in the vanishing locus. So I need to associate a sequence of natural numbers, d1 to dk, a sequence of ordinary parameters, a, a sequence of ordinary parameters, x1 to x k. So these are like maximal contact elements, as, as we'll see later. And then we, we also uh, um, we will also associate a monomial ideal Q. And then here I want to say that A and B, these are defined inductively on, on K. Uh, and then C is only defined at the end of the inductor. So the base case is when uh, I'm trying to define the first entry. Right. So for the first entry, uh, I just consider two cases. If the log in if, if the log order of I at B is infinity, right? So this just means the point is in the vanishing locus of this monomial. It's, it's in this vanishing locus of this monomial saturation I. Then I just set K to be zero. Uh, so, so basically that there, there are no ordinary parameters. And then I just set Q to be this monomial saturation. Uh, at, at P of course. So that's the first case. Uh, and then the second case is, if not, you have something that is of finite log order, right? But it must be strictly greater than zero because P is contained in the vanishing locus of I. And then in this case, you just set D1 to be the log order of P and I. And then just set X1 to be a maximum content of element of I at P. Right. And therefore, inductive purposes are also set I1 to be I. Uh, and then we will proceed to the inductive step. So, so we, only we only proceed to the inductive step in case two. But for case one, everything is already defined. Right? There's nothing here. And then I have a Q. Right? So, in case two, you, so in case two, now you've made a choice of X1. And now you have to know yeah. that. You yeah, so here I made a Yeah. So here I made a choice of X1, so that's a very good point. So later on, I have to show like B1 and BK are independent of choices of X1 to X2. So that's, abso that's abso absolutely necessary. Uh, and then here's the inductive step. So now assume that for some L, strictly less than K, so remember K is this, this number at the end, right? So for, for, like for some L less than K, I've defined the sequences B1 to BL, uh, and then we have an ideal IL as well, right? So for simplicity, you can just assume I, like for example, I, I've already defined it, right, from earlier. And then what the inductive step is doing is, uh, so the naive approach is to just take IL, you restrict to XL equals to zero, uh, and then you define BL plus one and XL plus one on, based on this log order, right? That's, that's a very naive thing to do. But, this, 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 like, like, should I expect this to work, right? So the problem is this sequence B1 to BK and Q, uh, this, this depends on the choice of X1 to XK, right? So there's this idea of Hironaka and, and, and Votacek, which is to, to kind of rebalance this ideal I, L, so that it all locally, it looks the same along any choice of MC hypersurface XL equals to zero. So once you have something that, that's like satisfying this property, you can kind of expect this B1 to be, I mean, you can kind of expect these things to be independent of choice of X1 to X2. So by, by, by D balance, I precisely mean this, this one more ingredient. So there's this ingredient of co coefficient ideals. So whenever the log order is strictly less than infinity, you associate this coefficient ideal to I. So, this is a big mess here. Yeah. But all I'm saying here is this coefficient ideal is just a B factorial greater piece of, of this OY sub algebra of OYP generated by putting I uh, at grade, uh, or rather at grading B, right? or rather I, I, I put it at weight B, and then I put the first derivative at weight B minus one, second derivative at weight b minus two, and so on and so forth. This will be weight one, right? And then I'm taking the b factorial greater piece kind of because that uh, b divides b factorial and so does b minus one and so does b minus two and so does 
so and so forth to one. So that's the point of coefficient ideal. You're kind of balancing everything out. And then you, know, you can just ignore this remark. That's, that's not important. For that. So that's the definition of coefficient ideal. It's, a, it, like it's a ingenious idea of Hiranaki and Rodacek. So that's what they mean by the balance. And then it turns out that this coefficient ideal looks the same along any MC hypersurface. So right now, I, I, I'll use this coefficient ideal to, to define the inductive step. So recall that I have B1 to B L, right? And X1 to X1, right? And then I have an ideal I L contained in this. That's the inductive step. So right now, just set, set I L plus one to be this coefficient ideal. And then once you take the coefficient ideal, you restrict to X L equals to zero. Right. So right now uh, I'll define uh, BL plus one and XL plus one. So if the log order of I at P is infinity, uh, then, then the induction is done. You just set K to be L and then you set Q to be this monomial ideal at, at P. And then if not, you do the same thing. You set BL plus one to be this log order and XL plus one to be a maximal contact element of IL plus one FP. And then you just repeat this inductive step uh, with, with this X prime input. And that's how we define uh, what I set up to do earlier, right? So, so right now I have all this auxiliary data. I have B1 to BK and X1 to XK. And then I have this monomial ID too. So any questions before I move on? Okay, so, so one thing I want to say here is, uh, so one lemma I proved in my early paper is precisely the statement that we want to be K and Q, this, this do not depend on the choice of X1 to X K. And, 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 like, like, and the proof is precisely this statement here. I mean, it how locally it looks the same. Along any MC hypersurface. Right. So right now I have all this auxiliary data, right? And then now I can define the invariant. So the invariant of I at P is precisely whatever that's going on in this slide. It's kind of complicated. But but the point of why I'm dividing throughout by these numbers, right? Is because that so for example, if I look at this second entry, right? Um we call that just now I, I kind of took the coefficient ideal, right? Of I B1, right? But this coefficient ideal is placed at weight uh, B1 factorial, right? So we are accounting, like we are over accounting stuff. So, so to kind of bring it back to weight one, that's why I, have, I, like I have to divide it by B1 minus one factorial. Is that okay? I see a puzzle thing. Okay. And then same same for same for the subsequent entries. I guess uh, it's hard right hard. It's, it, it's hard to understand until knowing what comes next. Because if, if later on it's gonna be ordered lexicographically, I don't know why you necessarily even care about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you can't remember those things from then. It's kind of uh night methods again. Uh just that so so one difference from then is there's there's no monomial ideal here. So whenever a monomial idea is not equal to zero, uh, we just chop an infinity in it. Everything else is basically the same as what 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 then about the which did. And then we'll usually denote the finite entries by a one. So yeah, this this is kind of a more to explain actually. I mean, but 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 all I want to say is you're you're kind of dividing this this denominator precisely because you're kind of over accounting stuff when when you take coefficient ideas. So you kind of have to bring everything back to the origin, like, like the original world in a sense. Yeah, and then this here comes another thing that's hard to explain in, in, in one hour. So, so we are always well order this set of all invariants by some lexicographic order, uh, but with this small caveat. I mean, you can just ignore this caveat. Then. So, so this caveat just says that one, one, one is strictly less than one, one. So whenever I, cut a sequence, it's always strictly larger than the sequence itself. So it's a very strange thing. Uh, 
but it's kind of motivated by by the proof of things, I guess. So it's not it's something I can't explain in one hour. Uh, but you have to take take it as it is. So right now, just think of it as we are ordering this set of invariants by lexicography, and lexicography just means that. So if I, if I look at this right, like even though five is strictly greater than three, uh, this is still strictly less than that because two is strictly less than three. So that's just the lexicographic one. So now I have this invariant. Now I just set the maximum invariant to be uh, the like the maximum of all in p at uh, the maximum of all in p i at p, and then I have this lemma. Uh, so in i at p is precisely uh, like a sequence of ones, precisely if you have something smooth and not smooth. So this is what I mentioned at the, like, like the start of my talk. You kind of want to reduce everything to a sequence of ones, and then that's how you prove the And then part two just says that in i at p is upper semi-continuous on y. This is important because uh, this just says that the worst singular locus. So by worst singular locus, I mean uh, the set of points P and Y such that, or rather P and X, such that in P and X is, wait, this is your worst singular locus. This worst singular locus is close in Y. So you're always blowing out something close in Y. And then tree just says that, uh, tree just guarantees functorality uh, with respect to not smooth matrix. I mean, sometimes you need subjective as well. Uh, that's why subjective comes into play here. I mean, you kind of need F to be subjective so that uh, maximum invariance stays the same. So that when you pull back, you're not getting an empty, like, like an empty blow up. So that's, that's just some properties. Uh, I see I'm running out of time soon. So here's just one more thing. So the blow up center. So right now I define an invariant, right? But I haven't told you what's the blow up center. Right? So the blow up center is precisely combining everything together. So you fix a P in Y, sorry, a P in X. So you fix a P in X such that the invariant of I at P is equals to this maximum invariant. This is a point in your worst singular locus. And then you set this local center, JIP, to be this, whatever this is. So one thing I want to note is this is not an ideal, precisely because uh, A2 to AK, right? If you recall from earlier, these are rational numbers, right? They are not integers. So I have to define what this is. This is kind of like a Q ideal. Right, so I have to kind of define what, what this is. And then you have this monomial ID at the end. And then I have to like raise it to the power of one over D precisely because of the same reason from before, right? I'm kind of over accounting stuff because I, I like, like keep taking coefficient ideas. So I want to bring everything back down. And that's why I divide it by this. And then right now I'll define what, what I mean by Q ID. So, so a Q ID here is, it's an integrally closed Ries algebra. So a Ries algebra I just mean like a OYP sub algebra of, of, of this ring here. So it's an integrally closed Ries algebra defined locally at P, given by this integral closure in OYPP of this sub algebra generated by all this thing. So, so the point of this, right, is just that uh, I'm thinking of X. So there's an I here. So. I'm thinking of x a i and i dot t and i. I'm thinking of this as x i a i. So I'm choosing some n i large enough such that I can write it like this, whereby this is like, like these are whole numbers. And then I'm just thinking of this fraction as, as this, right? So I, I, like, like I'm thinking of it this way because if I re if if it, it, like, like if I pass to integral closures, right? Then if like, like if this element is part of the Ries algebra, it kind of says that x a i dot p will be part of the Ries algebra, provided that uh, so this is also in G I P, uh, provided that 
provided that AI is a positive integer, like, like positive integer, right? But if it's not positive integer, I kind of have to, I mean, you kind of know what I mean. I mean, like x cubed dot t square, right? This is not part of the Ries algebra. Right? But I'm kind of thinking it as being there. I mean, that's, that's the point of two ideas. And then there's a small remark here as well. Note that the diff Veronese sub algebra of JIP is generated in degree one. Uh, this remark is kind of important because just now I, I told you I'm taking multi weighted blocks along monomial ideals, right? Or more generally, um, monomial Ries algebras. But I can only define it for monomial Ries algebra by passing it to Veronese sub algebra, which is generated in degree one. And that's the point of this. But, but for not, but but for starters, you can just ignore this one. Uh, so right now I have this block center. And then the point is uh I can glue up all these local centers. So this is a gluing lemma. So I glue up all these Reese algebras and I get a global Reese algebra. And then to be clear, this is precisely our block center from like right, with, with respect to I. And then there's some small remarks. This is some properties as well. So JI is containing the Ries algebra of I. This just says that uh, our block center is contained in the vanishing locus of I. So you're always blowing up something contained in I. And then there's, there's this remark here. Uh, this is precisely used to prove that actually. Uh, and then it's this is also needed for functional reality. So part two is needed for functional reality. So these are some standard properties. So now I have this block center here. And then here, here comes the last two slides. Uh, so, so one very subtle thing is, uh, if you look at this, this algebra, right, which I define, this is not exactly a monomial Ries algebra because uh, you have, like, like Q is part of the log structure, but X1 to XK are not part of the log structure. Right. But I can kind of think of it as a monomer Ries algebra because these are just parameters, right? So one very subtle thing here is um you kind of have to explain why everything glues up together. So so this is precisely a gluing lemma. So the gluing lemma says that there is this a global multi-weighted law of y along this center, such that pi is an isomorphism away from this more singular locus. And then part two says, like part two just says that whenever I, I have a point P in the worst singular locus, then pi ji uh, restricts to the multi weighted law of i of, of, of y along this local center. So this is a gluing type of lemma. It's like the proof is kind of convoluted, but so I'll say a few remarks. To make oh, yeah. to make sure I understand what you're saying is you're not you're not saying that J of I glues, but that the blow up glues. So one thing is I'm saying J I also glues as the then, point here. But then what's the problem? You just blow it up. If J of I glues, then then oh is it that, that, like, like, that's, like, like that's precisely what I said here, right? Like with, Precisely because x1 to xk are not part of log structure. Uh, so x1 to xk are kind of like local things. All right. So you still have to explain why everything moves. And that's precisely this, like, like, like this theorem. Great. So this theorem is very subtle. It's something I agree. Uh, it's something which then we don't realize at first as well. So we kind of have to write an argument for, like, like for this new lemma. And then this growing lemma is precisely proven by like kind of a bottom up approach. We, we show that this multi weighted blow up factors through something in my first paper, this weighted toroidal blow up. So you're taking the stacky approach of whatever this is. This is something like some reduced center of GI. So, it, so, it, so, so, uh, so by saying it factors through, I'm just saying that um, I can kind of think, I, I, how do I say? So, so through this lemma, I can kind of prove that um, everything blows up. So I can't exactly explain in one minute, I guess. I, I guess I'm over time, but. And then the last thing which I just want to say is, uh, that's this theorem as well. So the maximum invariant does, uh, like, like for the weak transform. 
And then since the proper transform contains the weak transform, we, we get this inequality. And then that's main theorem. And then with that, yeah, that, that, um, that's, that's the end of my talk. Thank you. Excellent. That's great. Again, thank you. We have done the meter song.